Agora TV. The world is thinking. So why did this constitutional convention, which included the leading statesmen of the American Revolution, statesmen who had risked their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to secure their rights, give so little consideration to a Bill of Rights? The president of the convention, George Washington, later told his French comrade-in-arms, the Marquis de Lafayette, that there was not a member of the convention who had the least objection to what is contended for by the advocates of a Bill of Rights. So why was there not one included? There are two prominent theories. The first rests on the framers' conception of the national government. That conception and that objection was set out by Alexander Hamilton, who co-authored the Federalist Papers, a series of newspaper articles, really op-eds in the modern parlance, urging the states to ratify the Constitution. The Federalist Papers remained the single greatest American contribution to political science. Hamilton and Madison were the principal authors, but John Jay, who would become the United States' first Chief Justice, also contributed to the collection of essays. Hamilton argued in Federalist No. 84 that the Constitution is itself, in every rational sense and to every useful purpose, a Bill of Rights. He emphasized that the United States Constitution was the product of a free people exercising their right of self-rule. They created a limited national government that could exercise only the powers that they, the people, had conferred. In Hamilton's view, there was no need to guarantee particular rights because the people reserved everything that was not granted. What's more, he argued, the inclusion of a list of rights was dangerous because it would imply the exclusion of others that were not listed. The second theory why the framers did not include an express bill of rights is considerably more mundane. It rests to a significant degree on the weather. The convention delegates struggled through an unseasonably hot summer in Philadelphia, not unlike the one Philadelphia is enjoying this summer. And by the time they'd reached agreement on the structural framework of the nation's charter, they were simply too exhausted by that effort to take up the task of negotiation, negotiating a separate Bill of Rights. George Mason's suggestion that a declaration could be drafted in a few hours was, of course, wildly optimistic. Unless, as I suspect was the case, he simply thought the delegates would plagiarize the declaration that he had drafted for Virginia. Moreover, there was good reason for the framers' reluctance to undertake what some skeptically called parchment barriers. James Madison, who was instrumental in negotiating the Constitution and promoting it as a co-author of the Federalist Papers, raised that objection. He observed that a mere declaration of rights without some structural mechanism to control an overbearing government was most likely to be ineffective on the very occasions when its control would be most needed. Despite the arguments of Hamilton and Madison, the absence of a Bill of Rights immediately became a matter of sharp controversy. A number of prominent American statesmen were strongly opposed to ratification of the Constitution. These so-called anti-federalists argued to the public that the absence of a Bill of Rights put their liberty at risk and that the Constitution should therefore be rejected. Although the anti-federalists decried the absence of a Bill of Rights, they primarily objected to the Constitution because it diminished the power of the individual states. They invoked popular fear over the absence of a Bill of Rights as a means to achieve their key objective of blocking ratification of the Constitution. 